Hello, welcome everyone. My name is Rafael. Thank you for joining me for this talk. If you got confused because you wanted to see another talk that was printed in the schedule originally, uh, don't fear if you still want to see that talk. You can just Google the title of the other talk. I already gave it at another conference. You can find a YouTube video on it. So, but the topic I will now speak about is plugin ecosystems for Python web applications. And before I do that, let's do a very quick show of hands. Who of you would call themselves a Python software developer in some way? Okay, that's all. Who of you does web development in some sense? Okay, that's still all of you. Um, who of you has used WordPress before? That's half of you. <laughs> okay, so that's still quite a lot, even though we are on a Python conference. And the reason for this is probably that, according to some sources, WordPress is powering um, more than a quarter of the web, which is quite a lot. And we could ask ourselves the question, why a single application is, is that, or why it can be that successful, or why a single open source project can be that successful. And part of the reason for that is probably that um, it's very easy to install on even the cheapest web hosting platform, and you get it running very quickly. But I think the major reason for this is the rich plugin ecosystem. There are like 50,000 plugins for WordPress, and they are coming in all shapes and sizes. There are small ones that allow you to embed videos in your blog posts better, and there are huge ones which embed whole e-commerce shop systems into your content management system. I don't say that's a good idea, but it exists. So um, I myself am the main developer and maintainer of Pretix, which is an open source event ticket shop. So it can be used to sell um, tickets for concerts, conferences, and any kind of event you could imagine, and it's implemented on a Python and Django stack. And one of the key design goals when I started the project more than three years ago was to be very extensible, because if you have an open source project of this kind, um, normally when technical people use it and they have a very special event, because every event is very special, as we know, and they will they will patch around the code base, they will make their changes, so they will no longer be able to run upgrades, they will, nobody else will profit from their changes, and it's kind of not, not a nice situation to be in. So I want, if, if you run an event and if you want to use Pretix for it, you should never get into the situation of patching the code base without contributing the patch back to the main project. You should instead be able to write some kind of extension that just can plug in via defined API and do everything you want to need. So what could that be? For example, we could think about adding more payment methods. By default, Pretix ships with credit card and bank payments and some other stuff. But you might want to write a Bitcoin plugin to have Bitcoin payments for your event, or you want to have additional export formats, additional APIs, integrations with services, or you really want to add more features into the, um, into the application. For example, you could put a content management system in your shop application, which I think is a better idea than the other way around, and very useful, for example, to host your terms of service or other static content that your shop might have. So we need some plugin system like WordPress does, and how do we get there? Um, we first need to find a nice and, and clean design pattern that allows those extensions to hook into our code and modify things. Then we need to provide many of those entry points where the extensions can hook into, and the most important thing is we need to document it very well, otherwise nobody will ever write an extension or a plugin. And, and that's basically it. So the complicated part will be this first step of getting a nice design of, of allowing those plugins to integrate and, and making it very easy to do so. So I will show some code, and that code will be somehow specific to Django, but the concepts behind it are not. So even if you're using a different Python web framework or none at all, the concepts will still be, you will still be able to, to apply similar concepts, um, although I think it's, it's the easiest with Django. So 
So to dive in, we will create a very simple, what we call signal layer that allows the different components, in this case our main application, our plugins, to, to communicate with each other. And for this, we um, define this signal class and that is very simple and objects of that class have one single attribute which is a list of functions that will later receive the signal when it's sent out. And we have two methods on this class. The first one is the register method. Um, unfortunately, if I turn away to show something to you, you will hear me worse. So this register method will take a function and just append it to this list, and that's all it will do. And then the other method will be the send method that calls all functions from that list with the arguments passed to the send function collects all of the results in new list and, and returns that new list. Now in our main application we can, we can define a signal um, by just creating an object of this class and giving it a name. For example, we could have the user created signal that um, we will send out every time we create a new user. And in our plugin we could have um, a listener function that just calls this register method as a, as a decorator here. The, if you're not familiar with the decorator syntax, everything it does is co to call this, this method with this function itself as an argument. So as soon as this code is executed, this function will be added to this list. And every time we call the send method on the signal, um, all plugins that registered a function for, for this signal will be called. And this is already a way to communicate between the code bases that do not really know anything about each other and cannot explicitly um, call each other. And if you're on Django, I highly recommend you not to use this implementation, but to use the django.dispatch.signal implementation instead, which has a very similar API, but handles some very nasty things for you. It's thread safe, it uses caching, it uses weak references to avoid you building any memory leaks. So if you're on Django and there's no reason not to use the, the one provided um, by Django. Also, if you're on Django, I highly recommend that you view your plugins as being represented by a Django app. For those of you not familiar with Django, a Django app is basically a collection of code. So models, migrations, views, templates, static files, URL configuration, all kinds of code that logically belong together within a Python package usually is, is seen as an application. Um, the reason for this is, is that we want our plugins to provide their own database models. They should be able to yeah, have their own data stores, so they should be able to provide their own plugins, and they should be able to ship with static files and so on. So we want that our plugins can do everything that a regular Django app does. So the same way that you already do when you have a, a non-monolithic Django code base with multiple applications that all have their distinct responsibilities. If we now just leave it at that and just use those standard Django capabilities, then we can just install a, what we now call a plugin like a Django app. We first get the source code somewhere, install it as a Python package, add it to the installed apps list in settings.py, include it to our URL configuration, and, and that's already getting too complicated. We want it to be very, very simple for our, the users of our applications or the people who install our web application on their servers um, to install a new plugin. We don't want them to touch the code base of our main project. We don't want them to go into settings.py and adding some things to some lists and deal with URL configurations. All we want them to do is to pip install the plugin and, and maybe run migrations to establish database tables. That's, that's the most we want them to do. So how do we get there making it this easy? The first step will be in the dunder init file of our plugin package to 
provide an app config class. This is something that Django does implicitly for you if you, if you don't do it yourself. It's just the, the meta description of your, of your Django app. It has a name, it has maybe a verbose name, there's some more settings you can, you can set. And in our case, we will add this subclass that we call uh, Pretix plugin meta. This is just of one of infinitely many possible ways to, to make it, to, to, to show that this plugin is supposed to represent, uh, this Django app is supposed to represent a Pretix plugin and nothing else. And there's one more thing we, we do here is we tell Django that as soon as everything has started up, we want Django to import the Python module where we define those listener functions I showed you earlier because the decorators will only be called and the function will only be registered as a listener if the file is actually imported at the right time. So we want to make sure that that happens and we set this, this plugin app, app config as, as our default app config. So now we take our plugin package and we bundle it as a Python package like for, for uploading it to PyPI like we normally would. For that, we need a setup.py file that has the standard boilerplate that you probably all know um, that is about, that has a name and dependencies and the packages included and, and stuff like that. And the, the interesting part is that entry points argument here that probably most of you haven't seen before. And what entry points is, is kind of the integrated plugin manager of, of Python setup tools. And what we, what we say here is that we want to register this package for the pretext.plugin entry point group um, with this unique name and this package name. In this case, they are just the same for, for convenience. And we can also pass a Python identifier here that we don't really need for this case. So I just passed in the name of the subclass, but in the end, it doesn't matter. So as soon as we install this Python package, um, this will be written into a list inside the, your local Python environment. And every time, and, and from our main application, we can enumerate all those entry points. And this is exactly what we will do in our settings.py file of our main application, we will just iterate over all installed Python packages that are, belong to the group pretext.plugin. And if we find one, we will add it to our installed apps list. So the user won't have to touch the settings.file themselves, but it can just uh, pip install our plugin and it will be automatically detected, which is exactly what we wanted in the first place. Um, we will use a similar method for the URL configuration. We want that our plugin just can add URLs to our application by itself by just providing a standard URL config module. And so we expect the plugin to just have a standard Django app urls.py. And in our, um, in our main application, we can now build a list of those patterns by iterating over all um, apps registered with Django, checking if they are marking themselves as such a plugin and want to be handled by that. If they do, we check if they have a URLs module. If they do that, we import that module and we add it to our list of patterns with an Django URL include uh, with the Django URL include function, and we use the label, which is something very similar to the name of the app, as, as the namespace here, which will become relevant in a second. And then we include the list of all of this includes as a new URL rule with a plugins namespace. So what we've built here is a URL configuration that automatically detects all installed plugins and builds a nested namespace of the URL names. Um, if you're not familiar with Django, Django uses names of URLs to allow you to easily generate URLs, for example, when generating a link, um, so that you have the definitions of all URLs in one place and can later um, reference those URLs by their name. And it would be very unpleasant if we had now collisions in our names because every plugin defines a list name or something like that. So we will now automatically here 
generate URL names that are both deterministic and unique because they are namespaced by plugins and by the name of the plugin and then um, the URL name actually given by the plugin. So if you want, um, that now is our plugin system that has the feature of the automatic um, detection of everything installed. But if we want, there's even more we can do. For example, in Pretix, we want to enable or disable plugins per event. So we have the conference here that uses feature A, and we have the concert here that uses feature B, and they don't want to see anything about the other feature or vice versa. And we want to enable or disable plugins sort of per user in, um, on the fly. And we can do this by extending the signal class that you've seen earlier just a little bit. The send method now needs to take the user, in our case the event, and the, um, our database needs to store a list of enabled plugins, which is just the, the Python module names for, for every, every user, every event. And then the, the, send, um, the send method will just check that it only calls the receivers which are from a, plug, from a Python module that is within an enabled plugin uh, here. Uh, and this sounds really, really simple, but it's really powerful. Because if we now also throw in some magic into the URL config that disables all views um, that, are, um, that are not uh, from a plugin that is enabled, basically we throw in a decorator that will be automatically applied to all views. That gets a bit technical, but it's, it's not that complicated. Um, then we get this, this nice view from the, in, the, in the settings uh, view of, of, of Pretix, where you can just, with one click, enable and disable um, whole plugins, and their, complete fe their features will completely appear or vanish within, uh, just with the click of these buttons. And this, is, this sounds really simple, but it's really powerful, because the, the plugins don't need to know about their state of being active or inactive. They don't have to remember checking in if they're enabled every time. They can just rely on being called if they're enabled and not being called if, if they're disabled. And this makes it, makes it really convenient. Also, I believe to make your plugin system not only a plugin system, but a successful plugin system, you need to make it very easy. First of all, you need to make it very easy for you to provide those signals all over your application in useful places. And there's multiple strategies that we use there, and one of them is that we, for example, have a template tag that allows to emit a signal. For example, if you, if you see the page that confirms your order and shows the details of your order in Pretix, then this template will send out the Pretix control signals order info um, a signal and it will pass the order as an argument there. And what this template tag will do is um, send out the signal to all enabled plugins, collect their responses, and, and inline them here as, as HTML code. So all plugins can very easily add additional information to that page, um, depending on, on what they know about the order that the base application doesn't. And um, the, the implementation of this template tag is also pretty straightforward. I just show it for completeness. Um, it's mostly concerned with finding that name and importing it and then um, sending out the signal and concatenating uh, and then adding all the responses it gets to a list and then returning the concatenated um, version of that list. So, so um, this makes it very easy to, to provide signals. But you also need to make it very easy for the people who should write the plugins. And I've said it before and I will say it again. You need to document this very well. Otherwise, it will be near impossible to write a useful plugin. And I would also recommend to provide a cookie cutter template. 
uh, for your plugins. If you haven't heard of Cookie Cutter before, it's an awesome project that allows you to define templates of projects. For example, if you now open your shell, pip install Cookie Cutter, and then uh, Cookie Cutter, um, and then the, the repo URL of the Pretix plugin Cookie Cutter repository, then you will be asked a number of questions. For example, what's the name of your plugin? Give a short description. What's the license? And so on. And then you will be uh, presented with a ready um, project folder with all the boilerplate code there, with the working setup.py there, with the gaps already filled in. And you can start right away with the interesting parts. And you don't need to, to deal with um, you don't need to, to deal with all the boilerplate. So now there's only really one thing that distinguishes no that, that distinguishes um, our plugin system from the ones we know from the wild like WordPress ones, and it's not that I believe that the signal pattern is much cleaner than than what happens in WordPress, which is maybe due to the language in use. But um, it is that in WordPress we can auto-install plugins from the web interface and we, they can auto-update and um, we don't need to, to do this directly on our server. And while it would be certainly possible to do this in Python as well, I'd recommend strongly against it. Not only is it um, always a potential security hazard, it's also really, really hard to do well in the world of containerized environments, of multi-server deployments. Um, you could do it, but I wouldn't. So there's, there's more that I could, um, uh, that is interesting to see about this, but this is all I, I wanted to show you in this, in this quick introduction, and maybe we have now a little bit of time to, to discuss or um, to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It was nice and interesting for me. Um, so, do you have questions for this plugin topic? Yeah. I'm not really sure I understood the question correctly. I hope that I understood it correctly. So the, the question is if, if those plugins are intended to provide end user functionality um, in their own. Um, and yes, yes, they, they do. Um, for example, with the, the payment methods um, example I gave, or for example, Pretix normally um, generates PDF online tickets or tickets for your smartphone, but there is a plugin that um, that adds in the complete shipping pipeline if you want to send out paper tickets via mail. And then that's what, that would be an example for the, for the template tag. In this case, this shipping plugin would, would extend the order information page by the shipping status. Um, so it would drop in additional information for the end user there. Does that answer the question? Okay. So, I just, yeah. Um, how do you handle changes to the template? Um, not just enter some additional code below or above yes. something, but changing the content of the original template? Yes, um, you touched the, the, um, the dangerous point changes in general to your code. Um, you need to. Um, to sort out what kind of compatibility guarantees you can give. Um, with Pretix, we give a pretty weak one, 
that between between major versions everything can happen but we try to um, have very good uh, we try not to break things that we know people do and we try to have good documentation on the upgrade paths so of course th there is a compatibility problem here like every time you have an api yeah uh, i think you misunderstood me yeah maybe Oh, okay. Okay, so um, this is this is a trade-off here. I don't want to give plugins too much power because I don't want them to be able to degrade the usability and the stability of the application too much. But I also want that they can do everything they want. Um, the trade-off here is that things like inserting a new snippet to the template should be very easy. And making major modifications it should be hard, um, but it's still possible. Uh, for example, we have a signal that allows you to act like a middleware. This would be one way to do everything you want. Also JavaScript. Well, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so before you get your coffee break to, to minor things, first of all, um, if you're somehow involved with running events, we are also providing commercial hosting and support to fund the Pretext project, come and talk to me. Also, if you're interested in Django at all, DjangoCon Europe will be in Germany next year, and it will be pretty close from here. And you should now all um, follow the Twitter account, subscribe to the newsletter, and tell your employer to sponsor the conference. Thank you very much.